<laughs> Thank you, Craig. So, well, it's always, it's always uh, an, quite an experience. Oh, everyone left me alone. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, it's always an intimidating experience to speak to people. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's, uh, it's always also a great privilege to be, to be with the saints, whatever they are, and whatever word, whatever word they're in. And looking at all of you, I, it's just inspiring. So, before I say anything, I want to say a few words of testimony. It's very important to me. I want everyone here to know that I know that we are a part of the true, the one, the only restored church of the Savior Jesus Christ. We have the, the fullness of his gospel. We have precious scriptures with us, wisdom and knowledge, and we are led by a prophet of God and by prophets, seers, and revelators. I want everyone here to know that I know this. I, I know it. I've been a member of the church for 32 years. And, you know, it hasn't always been a smooth journey, but I've always known that these things to be true. And they are all, truly, the, this knowledge is a source of support and great comfort and strength for me. It has always been. I've, I always tell my wife this. I've learned to be a man, to be a person, only after I joined the church. I joined when I, I knew about the church when I was 20. I couldn't join until I was 22. And that's when I started my journey, not only in the gospel, but that's where I've learned everything that truly really matters in life to me. It's so... I want everyone to know this. I wanted to start with this testimony. So, how did that happen? It wasn't, I, I feel, I, when I, every time I talk about how I ended up in the church, I reflect back and I, I see the Lord's hands in it. At the time, it never seemed that this would be where my life would take me. But looking back at it, I know that the Lord's hand was, was in, in all of it. Uh, my parents are from a small town in, in Palestine. It's called Bejala. And Bejala is a small village that belongs to Bethlehem. So if you ever hear someone whose name is Jabra, you know that this person is from the Bethlehem. Only in Bethlehem. There are a million Jabras. You go three minutes outside of Bethlehem, nobody is called Jabra. Okay, so, so in Bethlehem there are three villages, and we were one of, uh, from one of them originally. My dad left to go work in Kuwait in 1959. Uh, he was sort of a rebel kid, and he didn't want to stay at home, and he had a sort of a bad relationship with his with his mom and he decided to leave town and so he went to the deserts of Kuwait and he worked with oil companies there five years later he married his gay first cousin don't freak out <laughs> so I'm, I'm the product of first cousins being married it's completely normal over there, <laughs> not here. It explains <laughs> a lot. You go to jail for doing it, right? <laughs> so, so they got married in 64, and they tried for children, to have children, but my mom just had difficult pregnancies, and she kept losing her children, until I came along in 1968. And... Uh, that was a year after the Israelis took our town. And so my parents couldn't go back. We stayed in Kuwait, and I grew up in Kuwait. Um, and I grew up there until I was 17. At 17, when you're not a citizen of the country there, they sort of kick you out. You can't stay there. So I went to Jordan which is the country of my dad's citizenship. One of the very few decisions that dad made right in his life was getting Jordanian citizenship. 
in 1959. Because otherwise, it would have been very tough for me to go anywhere. Um, in Jordan, my dad made the decision again. Uh, many of you here will feel very sorry for me now. When, we le when I graduated from high school, my dad said, well, you're going to college. Guess what? Uh, you're going to Jordan, and I'm sending your mom and your siblings with you. <laughs> so, no to independent college life. Uh, you're you're going to go and live with your mom. <laughs> Again, very normal in that culture. I wasn't happy about it. My mom is a difficult taskmaster. <laughs> and after 17 years of living with her, I was like looking forward to leaving the nest. Didn't happen. Didn't happen for 14 more years, believe it or not, except for three brief years at BYU. But my mom, my mom was crucial to the story. I'm kind of glad sometimes that she came with me, sometimes. Uh, we started looking for a home in Amman, that's the Jordanian capital. After a whole day of driving around, we find this place, it's this building. Uh, Christians in, in, the, in the Middle East, and so as opposed to Kuwait, where there were lots of nationalities, and Muslims and Christians lived together. In Jordan, Christians lived in their own buildings and neighborhoods separate from Muslims. So you, you rarely have a Muslim neighbor. So we found this building, and this building was sort of, I always call it the Northern Island of buildings in Jordan, because it was built by two relatives. One of the relatives was a sort of Nazarene Baptist, and the other relative was a Catholic. So it had this Protestant-Catholic conflict in the building. We rented from the Catholics, but one of the conditions for, 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 uh, for renting to us was you never speak to the Protestants. For real. Uh, so, but my mom, not being a good keeper of agreements, and being a woman who, if you tell her no about something, she actually goes and does it, like most of us, but she's sort of overdoes it. She started speaking to the Protestants. Uh, and one day, I come back from college, and the Protestant neighbor comes up, introduces herself, and says, we, me and your mom were talking. Now, when we moved into the Catholic building from Kuwait, I usually, as my wife can attest, I always move around with hundreds of books, sometimes thousands, with me. <laughs> and <laughs> so when we moved into the building, the Catholic, uh, the Catholic family had nine daughters. And the oldest one took a special interest in helping me out. And she was like moving books out to the apartment. Uh, I don't like people to when, like it when people touch my books. So, <laughs> but she was blonde, blue-eyed, fair. I was like, oh, good date. <laughs> <laughs> so I let her, I let her carry the books with me and help me out. And she was, she, she looks in my library. She's like, you have Muslim books, you have socialist books, you have all of these books. Where is your Bible? And I said, well, in Kuwait, we couldn't have Bibles. And my parents weren't religious. They were Christians. We come from a Greek Orthodox family. But my, my parents always had this sort of avoidance of religion. And so she was horrified when she learned I don't have a Bible. She runs downstairs, and she comes back a couple of minutes later. Sisters, don't do that to a guy. Luckily, we don't have pink copies of the Book of Mormon, but she gave me a pink Catholic Bible. <laughs> Every page on that, in that Bible was pink. And she said, here is the Word of God, read it. And I started going to church with her, the Catholic Church, but literally in those days it was before the Vatican decided that every congregation can use their local language. Uh, they spoke Latin. So you sit in there, and how does it go? It's all Latin to me, it's all Greek to me. I didn't understand a thing. And college started, and it was an excuse for me to say, I can't come with you to church anymore. But that night when I, when I came back from college, which was a few months later, 
uh, my mom introduced me to, to this neighbor and she said, uh, and the neighbor said, Jabra, we have a meeting with a very important person in our apartment and we want you to come over right now. So I go downstairs and there is a sort of revival meeting going on with the Protestant priest, the Nazarene Baptist priest sitting on this big couch and they take me in and they seat me right next to him. And so I heard this sermon and he was, he was teaching about the life of the Savior and about, about the atonement and it was the first time I heard that. And for some reason, my dad's story about the Savior was he, he was a magician, he lived in India, he came back, he rebelled against the Jews, they killed him, end of story. That's the gospel according to Farid Ghanem, my dad. <laughs> the gospel I heard that night in, in, in that meeting was completely different. And to learn what the Savior did for me was very touching. And at the end of the meeting, the, the Protestant preacher did something that was very exciting to me. He gave me a book. He, had, he gave me this beautiful, leather-bound New Testament, a blue, beautiful, leather-bound New Testament on fine paper. And he said, here is this. This is for me to you, and I want you to read it, but I want you to start with the Gospel of John. And I went back to my, my house, and I couldn't read anything else but that book. It wasn't pink, so that was a plus. And <laughs> the leather binding felt nice. And, you know, so I started reading it and I couldn't stop. And that whole week I was reading and, and I started from the beginning. I read the Gospel of John, finished it. And I was thinking, oh, I need to go read the beginning. And I started reading the book. And I found myself for the next year and a half just going to the Nazarene Baptist Church. And they, they took a special interest, you know, new, new blood, new person, everything. And I really liked going there. But there were all kinds of questions that were starting to come up. Every time I read it, there is a new question. So there is the question of the Heavenly Father, the Savior, and the Holy Ghost. Are they three? Are they one? What's the story there? And you listen to them in church, and it talk about them being three in one and all of that, and it just didn't make sense. You look at the scriptures, there are three separate people, several accounts. There are three separate beings in, in the Godhead. So that was the first one. And then the account of the Savior eating after the resurrection and having people touch him. So he was resurrected in the body of flesh and bones. And in the, one of the meetings I had with the leaders, you know, they had these seminars, and they said, uh, this is not, no kidding, no joking, they said, God is a cloud, one sees it like, think of God as a cloud. And I, my first reaction was, how can he be a cloud and be the creator of everything we, we have? And how do you respond to him having a body of flesh and bones? That doesn't make sense. And then you read more, and you read about the organization of the church after the Savior was here. And you think, what happened? It talks here about prophets, apostles. Doesn't God love us anymore? Why doesn't he talk to us through revelation anymore? Who leads the church? Um, so that was one more question. And then there was an incident one day that triggered the next concern. Uh, luckily, we don't do this in our church. It, save, it saves people a lot of embarrassment. But in Protestant churches, they, after the sermon, there is a tray that goes around and you're supposed to put money in it for, for the service. Uh, and I usually put money in it. One day I went to the meeting and I didn't have, I left my wallet, I didn't have any cash with me, but I had some Saudi money, which was worthless in Jordan. It was in my pocket. And uh, so when the tray came in, I was like, I can't just have the tray come in and not put anything. So I put the Saudi money in there. 
I didn't think much of it. When meeting finished, went and played ping pong, because I love playing ping pong. They had one in the basement, it's one of my favorite things. I'm not good at it by any means, I just love to do it. Uh, so I don't think I'm that great ping pong athlete here. Uh, and when I came back up to the chapel, I don't remember why, the preacher was just fuming. He was talking to the youth leader and he was angry. And he said something, look at the some moron, left me some Saudi money in here. And I wasn't offended, uh, but I really wasn't. I just thought, why do you why why do you have to be paid for using the priesthood and for teaching others? Like why do you have to be an employee who's who's being paid to do this? So that triggered the next thing about about the organization of, of churches. But the final thing from reading the scriptures is when you read about how much God loves us, you can never believe in the this idea of heaven and hell that no matter how good you are, you're going to go to hell if you don't believe in a certain religion or a certain belief. And you're going to go to heaven just because you're, you know, a Nazarene Baptist or a Muslim, or which is what pretty much everyone else believes in. So I took these things and I started inquiring. I started the Nazarene Baptist Church. So those churches work in circles. They call them circles. They go around and they meet each other and they go attend each other's meetings and all of that. So I'd meet with people and ask them these questions, and the response to my questions always ranged from, you need to pray about this, this is wrong, the devil is trying to get you, these are bad influence to, you're a complete idiot, how dare you think like that? And so after, I don't know, it was probably four or five months of being frustrated, I decided, I know the Savior lives, I know he's my savior, I'm not going to any church, I'm just staying home, uh, I'm not doing organized religion. That was it. And that was it. Until 1988, June. It was the night of the European Cup final, soccer, European soccer final. I was excited, Holland was my team, I forgot who they were playing, they were playing the Germans or some other team, and. And the phone rings. And there is this guy. His name, he says, hey, I'm Rami, your neighbor. Now, Rami is a son, one of the five sons that the Protestants had. But he was always the black sheep in the family. They had a picture of him in the foyer of the house. And every time I asked about him, they said, ah, oh, he's our son, poor him. He lives in this place called Utah. He joined the cult. And <laughs> <laughs> they worship the devil, and they are evil people, and, you know, just, just don't talk about him. He's a bad subject in this house. So he comes home, and he, apparently, somehow, some, one of them told him about me, and I think he took it as a challenge. Let me talk to this guy who left them, and let me become his friend. So he calls me. And I don't think he had any friends in the house, so that's probably another motivation he wanted someone to talk to while he was off from school. And he says, I'm Rami, and I said, yeah, I know who you are. And the first thing he said, he said, I have a message for you. And in Arabic, when you say message, there is a way to indicate that, hey, I'm going to preach a religious message to you. And I said, Rami, I've, I'm sorry, I'm about to watch a game here. <laughs> And um, you can come and watch it with me, but I don't want to talk about religion. I'm done with religion. I know the Savior lives, just, but I'm not interested. But he, so imagine your worst nightmare telemarketer. <laughs> okay, that guy was it for the gospel, though. And he wasn't bad, but he was persistent. And I was eager to get rid of him. <laughs> and traditions prevent you from uh, actually just hanging up. I was tempted. I'm looking at the TV and everyone is lining up and they're tossed the coin. And then I finally had this brilliant idea. Ask him your questions. And I said, okay, Rami, here's the deal. 
I have these five concerns about all Christianity. I'm going to give them to you, and I want you to tell me what your church thinks about them. He said, shoot. And at that point, if I had a gun, I would have shot him. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, I'm not violent. My wife is shaking her head. Which is when I know, when I realize I've said something I shouldn't shouldn't say. Which I'm prone to doing. So, <laughs> so I said the first one, I said, Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost. Three or one, he said three. And I said, three separate. He said, yes, we believe that. That was the first shocker. Nobody has ever told me that. But I said, ah, oh, he's a cult. He's in a cult. Maybe they do weird things. But that's a weird thing I'm willing to take. And I said, how about, how about their constitution? Like, I believe they have bodies. Does your church believe they have bodies? I said, yes, absolutely believe that. But the Holy Ghost is different. He, because of his mission, he has, he has a spirit body. That was the second shock. I was, uh, okay, again, cult. <laughs> they are going to be extraordinary. There's a reason the others don't like them that much. <laughs> and then I said, so, why doesn't God love us anymore? Why, why, don't we, do I, why don't we have prophets? Why don't we have revelation? He said, no, no, no. We actually have prophets. It started with Joseph Smith. And our prophet now is Ezra Taft Benson. Now, Ezra in Arabic is the angel of death. Now, that, <laughs> that cemented it as a cult. I'm like, cult, cult, cult. <laughs> Your prophet is Ezra. <laughs> so, and then I said, how about, how about, uh, how was, uh, how do people, like, do you have professional priests instead? Instead, he struggled to translate lay ministry. He couldn't say it. He said, no, we serve each other, and every one of us has a calling in the church, and we do service. We don't get paid for it. And every, men have the priesthood, and they give blessings, and we don't get paid. We don't want to take money from people for doing these things. Now, that, that was like, okay, not cult. <laughs> this is one. And finally, I said, heaven and hell, and that's where he started getting too technical, and he said, celestial, celestial, there are no Arabic words for them at the time. And he said, no, we believe in kingdoms of glory, celestial, celestial, terrestrial. And I said, okay, well, I told him, if you answer these questions to my satisfaction, you can come up here for 15 minutes. And that guy materialized at my door like Aladdin's genie. <laughs> <laughs> he shows up. He lived probably 16 flights of stairs below. And I hung up, and it was... <laughs> <laughs> Not kidding. And he shows up. I open the door, and he's holding a couple of legal pads. And... What I later learned were flip charts with images and church literature. And I said, okay, come in. Hey, how are you? Do you want tea, coffee? And I'm like, no, we don't drink tea and coffee. I was like, cult. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't drink tea and coffee? How dare you? And uh, we sat down. It was evening time, and I lost track of time. So but I think it was like 8 or 9 in the evening. And uh, by two in the morning, we finished the fourth discussion, the kingdoms of glory, and I just knew, this is, a, this is it. I found it, cult or not, I'm <laughs> I, this is it. I found a place that answers all my questions. I know this is it. It, it was just this sure knowledge. And I said, Rami, I, I know you're right. I know this is, this is true. I want to go to church with you. And he said, two more things. By two more things, he meant two more discussions. <laughs> so we stayed up till five in the morning. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't sleep. And, uh, and he said, tomorrow you come to church with me. And it turned out, believe it or not, for 
for two years, my mom, every time I came from college, she would say, we have weird neighbors. And I said, what, who? And she'd point to a, a building right next to us, and she'd say, Americans live here. And I said, well, we have Americans living in the country, all over the country, what's wrong about, what's wrong with these people? They're like, no, they're weird. <laughs> I said, what's weird about them? She says, they love their children. <laughs> I said, really? <laughs> now, <laughs> in the Middle East, American soap operas are dubbed into Arabic and broadcast on primetime TVs. So, Arab women watch Bold and the Beautiful, and they think, or General Hospital, and they think that American families are like that. And so, that, you know, they don't like their children, like in Bold and the Beautiful, it was a big scandal when the father married his son's ex-wife. I mean, things like it was a big deal. The Jordanian parliament had a special session to ban the show. And they succeeded because when that show was on air, I kid you not, no exaggeration, every car on the street in Oman disappeared. Everyone was home glued to see what will happen to what's her name, Brooke and whoever. I remember Brooke, that's the only one I remember. And so I said, so why do you say that? And she said, well, the mom just gets up in the morning and she takes the kids to the bus and she's waiting for them when they come back from school and she's feeding them. <laughs> and so, and I said, okay, that's, okay, maybe this is like a unique American family. They love their children and they take care of them. And she said, no, 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 but listen to this. I watched them on Fridays. A whole bunch of people show up at this house, all dressed up, and the children meet in the front yard and there are people teaching and playing with them. And I think they're singing. And... This is, this is strange, what's happening? So I never knew, but it turned out for the two years I was attending the Nazarene Baptist Church. I was living right next to the church branch, meeting in Matt Tuller's apart house, who was the branch president, because the church wasn't recognized in Jordan at the time. And so everyone, they were allowed to meet in apartments. So next morning I was eager to go to that place and meet those weird neighbors. Well, they weren't weird, but my mom's now. They were weird. But I waited and waited next morning. No phone call came. And finally, at noon, Rami called me. He says, sorry, I misspoke. I can't take you. And actually, I wasn't supposed to teach you, but I taught you last night. Because we have an agreement with the government that Jordanians, whether they are Christian or Muslim, cannot be taught. And that broke my heart. I just couldn't, I, I, I just, just was devastated. He said, I'm going to back to BYU, but I'll leave all the literature with you. And good luck. And I said, thank you for nothing. <laughs> you teach me all of this stuff and then you leave? Are you kidding me? But he did, and I continued to read, the, read. there was no scriptures, he get, left gospel principles, he left the missionary pamphlets and the flip charts, which were not very useful, it was, they were nostalgic, but not very useful. Um, and I spent the next two years just telling people I'm a Mormon, even though I wasn't baptized. So in the meantime, what was happening, and this is something I learned, I, I knew parts of it and I learned it recently. President Nelson was, while Eastern Europe was being open, he was having meetings in Jordan. And those meetings paved the way for the establishment of first a church center which is for BYU, it was called the BYU Center for Cultural and Educational Affairs. But it was really our, I don't want to use the word, but it was a front for the church, <laughs> <laughs> right? So, and uh, then he also managed to get permission to teach Christians if Christians approach the church. 
And the biggest thing, he called a missionary couple to come to Jordan. And I didn't know any of that stuff at the time until Rami comes back in May of 19, 1990. And I saw the car come in and he called me literally as soon as he entered the house. And he said, ready to go to church? And I said, I thought I can. And he said, no, here's what happened. So next morning I go in with him. It's 8 in the morning and I'm 7.30 in the morning in Amman, no, no taxis. I'm running around like a headless chicken on the streets trying to find a car. We find one, get to the church building, and I see people coming in. And I didn't, uh, I just, whenever I remember it, I see myself just running into the building. And at the head of the stairs stood Brother Tipton, who was, you know, the missionary, and his wife. And I shook, it, shook his hand and I said, my name is Jabra Ghanim, I want to be baptized. And he looks at me and I think he was shocked because who is this guy? Where did he come from? We, I'm sure we never taught him and he wants to be, be baptized. But he was a very humorous man, bless him. I just loved that couple. And he said, young man, in this place, we have appointments first. Or we have, you have to have an appointment. And I said, who do I have an appointment with? I, I want one. He said, with me. <laughs> and here's my number, and you call me after the service. And I went in my first service, and who was I sharing this with today? Well, I forgot. But I sat, I sat in the chairs, and... Uh, the hymn book opened, and Rami was next to me, and was teaching me to read the hymns. And as soon as the meeting started, I felt I was home. I felt I was where I've always belonged. I didn't know anyone in that meeting. They were Filipinos and British and Americans and people from everywhere. I didn't know anyone except Rami, but I felt I was amongst kin. So I was with my family. Um, and the feeling, the feeling has never left me. Every word I've been to in my life since then, I've always felt like I was with family. Like I'm feeling with you. I don't know any one of you except the recess. But I feel I'm with family. So I started taking the discussions over peach ice cream that Sister Tipton made, which was my favorite finished the discussions in a week. And then I wanted to be baptized, but the, the mission presidency, we were under the Swiss mission. I was the first person to ask for baptism in the country of Jordan. And I think they had no clue what to do with me. <laughs> Nothing whatsoever. So we're talking May, June, July, then August 1st. Woke up in the morning, taking my sister to school, turned the radio on, and I thought it was a joke, but Iraq has invaded Kuwait. So I panicked, head back home. My dad was still in Saudi Arabia, but he was in Kuwait the night before, so we were really worried. Drove back home, and my mom is hysteric. But we managed to get hold of dad and apparently had the inspiration the night before to leave Kuwait back to, to his apartment in Saudi. So he avoided being stuck in the middle of the invasion. Then I headed to church because we had an appointment and the missionaries were packing up. And I said, Brother Tipton, what's happening? He said, well, the, because of what's happening, the mission president has called us out to Germany. And here are the keys to the building. I want you to drive us to the airport. Here's the keys to the car. Bring the car back, and you're in charge of the building. And I said, Brother Tipton, I'm not even a member yet. He said, I trust you. And I remember taking them to the airport, and I cried all the way back. For 45 minutes drive, I was crying. Because here we are, again, I couldn't be baptized. And so, for two months after that, everyone left. 
the branch presidents, and they were all embassy employees, they evacuated, everyone left. Two Filipino members were left, two Filipino sisters. I didn't have the priesthood, I couldn't bless the sacrament. So every Friday, which is the Sabbath there, I'd go to church, open the building, drag the VCR now, many of you don't know what the VCR is, <laughs> right? Video player. It's, it's the ancestor of this, right? <laughs> and plug it in, and they had a big library that had every general conference recorded since the 80s. And I started every, the two poor sisters would come in. We had a nice, well-stocked library, had good church literature. So I'd go in there at eight, plug in the VCR, and plug in a session of conference. And for three hours, me and the two sisters would listen to conference. And I don't know if they appreciated that or not, but that was, I'm sure they were there for hoping that I somehow could bless the sacrament, but I couldn't. So, and that continued until September, September 10th, Barry Donald, who was the first counselor in the branch presidency, comes back and he called me and he says, guess what? I'm back. I'm like, welcome. Thank heavens. Where, where, who, where can we to give you the keys? And he says, don't worry about that. I have my own. But when do you want to be baptized? And I said, now? <laughs> he said, no, we've reserved the American embassies, club, swimming pool, uh, for you to be baptized there on the 14th. And uh, will you do it? And I said, I'll do it. And it was a Got up in the morning, snuck out of the house. My grandma my, was visiting. She's, she's a strict Greek Orthodox Christian. She would have shut me at the door if she knew I was going to be baptized and, and break what's called the Norun in the Greek Orthodox Church. Like that's a sacred bond to the church you're not supposed to break. So it was like an operation to sneak out of the house and not, not tell her where I'm going. And I got baptized that day. A very happy, very happy, very special, wonderful day. Um, and I was, I was home. For, I mean, what's the word? Touchdown. I made it. <laughs> Absolutely made it. And I was eager, I was wanting to do everything to make sure that I do everything I can do while, I, while here on earth, get the endowment, get sealed to a, to a wife, and all of these things, but those will have to wait. And then we had the problem with the war that was still going on, and I was supposed to go to Sweden to do my master's degree, but all, I was in the Jordanian military as a reservist, so I couldn't leave. People my age had to stay in the country. So I, I couldn't go to Sweden, where I was hoping that I would be in the bigger church. And so it was kind of desperate. And there were, the church was still small, but I was very grateful that the branch president came back and he had left his family back in Utah and he came back. So he would take me to his home and he introduced me to root beer, which I thought was a weird drink. <laughs> now I love it. I guess it's a sign of conversion, true conversion, <laughs> that you like root beer. And corn of the cup <laughs> with extra butter. Because that's all he could fix, really. We didn't have much else. Corn of the cob and root beer and the gospel, which was all the nourishment I needed. But he was, he was a great mentor, and I loved the time I spent with him. Uh, so the war ended, and one morning I receive a, a letter from the Tiptons, and they say, what happened? Why aren't you in Sweden? So I explained what happened, and Brother Tipton was a retired BYU professor, and he said, listen, send me your papers. I'll see what I can do. And a couple months later, I received a letter from BYU. 
you've been accepted to the master's program in the economics department <coughs> with a scholarship, and we'll give you a job on campus. So come over. But the problem was I had to get a visa to the United States, which was, which in the Middle East is almost next to impossible. So I go to the embassy with no paperwork other than my acceptance letter, a letter from the branch president, President Bradford, who worked at the embassy, and I didn't know what his job was. He gave me a cryptic Morse code type kind of form that he filled out. And he said, just give this to the officer who will interview you. And I went on a student line and I was number 629 at five in the morning. I was 629 in line. And people, you know, this is sort of like war stories. You stand in line at the American embassy and you hear people bragging about all the credentials they have and then you see them going out crying because they were rejected. And every time you see it, you're demoralized. This is not happening. This is not. So I go in. They, they ask me a couple of questions, and I come out, and I got my visa. Got in, got in the taxi, went home, and I told my dad, I'm leaving to Utah. Now, I was supposed to start in the fall, but now I had a visa. So I just didn't want to risk any more war happening, a Scud missile landing in a month, <laughs> destroying the airport. And when, when you have bad luck, you just, you're, you're like, I'm not taking chances. So I left, I came to BYU. And uh, I spent three beautiful years on campus. They, sometimes they were frustrating. Dating was frustrating. Uh, lots of rejection. I was like, what's wrong with me? Look at me, I'm a handsome young man. I, I speak I speak with an accent. I thought American girls loved that. I'm worthy. Come on. I'm a catch. Marry me. <laughs> but no, nobody would do it. <laughs> no bueno. So... <laughs> So after lots of rejection and intrigue, I finished my master's degree and I was visited by, so a year before I graduated, uh, a brother from the translation department visited me and he said, we have, come visit me in Salt Lake. We have all of this Arabic literature, church literature that needs to be translated in Arabic. So I go to his office in the corner, there is a stack that's six foot high, six feet high. And he says, we need to translate this. So I started doing it while I was at BYU. But in 93, when I graduated, uh, a new manager came and he said, I'm leaving to Europe, but we need someone to be in the area. We can't give you the work while you're here in the US. And uh, if you come back, then you, the job is yours. So at the time, I was planning to go to Harvard because I was accepted there, but they didn't give me a scholarship. And my dad wouldn't give me any support because he wanted me back home because he and my mom were absolutely worried that I'm going to end up marrying an American. <laughs> you can't, now you've been reading the Old Testament and you know about how the people over there feel about interracial marriages. They, my parents were like that. Uh, you, can't, you can't marry a Canaanite which is what an American woman is to that culture. <laughs> they, they had no idea that that was my plan. <laughs> I was gonna make it happen. I wasn't gonna marry an Arab girl, that's for sure. I'm, I'm sort of like Esau in that regard. <laughs> Not as hairy, probably. <laughs> so, I went back, I worked for the church, the, the translation translated, I think I've translated every single piece of church literature for phase one. And I think I've had my hands in every conference since 1994, except for a small interruption when I worked in Dubai, I translated for the church. And that's a source of a huge, a huge blessing in my life to be taught the gospel 
from prophets and seers and revelators, to be so close to church literature, to understand it. Uh, I've been I was involved in the first attempt to retranslate the Book of Mormon into Arabic in 1995 and stopped. Then I ended up retranslating it finally with the grace of God in 2000, 2014. They involved me again, and I did it, and then did the Doctrine and Covenants. I've been involved in conference, and just, just a source of great blessings. But this, this story wouldn't be complete without talking about this wonderful woman who sits there for a minute. She hates it when I mention her in public. I'm, I'm banned from posting on Facebook anything emotional or lovey-dovey. So, <laughs> so I can't do Valentine's, I can't do anything, because she hates it. But I'm going to embarrass her here a little bit. My sister ends up marrying a person in Midville. She met him on the internet. In 1999, and before... What do you call it? Tinder? Tinder? Oh. Right? <laughs> there was chat rooms and all of that stuff. She moves to Midvale. With, she marries this guy. It was a crazy marriage, which is a totally different story. And she moves into a ward where she meet, where her visiting teaching companion at the time, that was way before ministering. And uh, that person was the sister of a member of my branch in Amman. Now in Jordan, I was the branch president for the Amman branch for many years. And I've, I've known the family, but she was an inactive sister. And my sister moved into the world of her active sister, who happened to be Stacy's friend, and she's her friend to this day. So one night, when my sister and her visiting teaching companion are sitting down over cake and a drink, they hatch up a plan to hook me, I was working at the time in Dubai, in the United Arab Emirates, with this wonderful lady who was going to law school in Boston. And she sends me an email, and she says, send an email to this, to this person here. And her name is Stacy, and you know, just talk to her. And I send my sister back an email, and I say, I can't make this work in real life with people that I can see right in front of me. Well, I don't think I can do that over email. And, but she said, do it. Promise me you'll do it. Now, Arab women are very forceful. They make you have these secret oaths and they have these swear oaths. So you have to do it. And being a man of honor, I picked up my, one night I was working late and I said, okay, I promised her, so I'll do it. So I write a letter and I say to, I send, I send Stacy an email and I say, hey, my name is Jabba Ghanem, here's who I am, my sister knows your friend. And uh, they said, we should talk and just to let you know, I'm interested in a long-term relationship, which apparently triggered alarm, alarm, <laughs> in her mind. <laughs> And she, my, my intent was, I'm very serious about this. I'm not playing around. I'm, I'm not going to fool around here. So, but after several attempts to talk to her, which included one of her roommates seeing me typing on Messenger, it was like a chat room thing at the time, and was in her dorm at, at that point, saw me sending messages, and she decided to impersonate her, and I talked to her roommate. And I thought, oh wow, that was a great conversation. <laughs> and then we ended up talking, we ended up talking, and the rest is history, as they say. I, she fell madly in love with me. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I was young and foolish and made several attempts to see her in Boston that failed. And then I finally meet her and uh, just, I was crazy. She didn't like my exercise routine. I, I would sit, stand in the room doing karate chops and all of that stuff, <laughs> thinking it's impressive. <laughs> But finally, after lots of begging, she fell in love with me and she said yes to me. She 
Lots of pleading. Come on, you're my last chance here to turn on happiness. And I know you are the one. So, yeah, and we've, we've been, we'll be married for 22 years in a couple of months. 22 wonderful, happy years despite of everything. And that's my story. My family, my, all of my family ended up joining the church. My dad passed away, and unfortunately, the rest of them have fell away, which is one of the heartbreaks in my life right now. But here is, here is the thing, my, my, con my concluding message. We, we're reading the Old Testament. It's a wonderful book because the characters in there are real life characters. Their troubles, their challenges, the difficulties that they face are real. But one message that has occurred to me while I've been reading the Old Testament the past few weeks is this. Notice it when you read the scriptures. You have the, the Jewish mothers, right? You have Sarah, you have Rebecca, even before you have Eve, you have Noah's wife, you have Rachel, you have Leah. And notice, notice this pattern in the Old Testament. Every great prophet is born after their mothers have lots of tribulation. And then they end up going into cycles. Like right now, we're reading the, what's called in, in Old Testament studies, the Jacob cycle, where Jacob goes through his trials of life, culminating in him meeting the Pharaoh and describing his life as miserable and wicked and hard. So, Life is full of troubles. Life is full of troubles. And you will, will see them in one form or another. You will face them. Um, Stacy and I were single for a long time. She was 30 when we got married. I was 33. And man, it, those years when I was single, you think, especially when you know the promises of eternal marriage and how important they are, you think that they will never be away, that, that you will never find love, you will never get married, you'll never find, find the right person. But I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed about it, and I never lost hope. And the result, I found my dream love all the way across the ocean. A precious, wonderful woman that I adore, my eternal friend and partner. And then, but then you find happiness, right? You find marriage, then you want children, right? And then, no children. We've been married 22 years, we have no kids. Which, which was a trial for us for a long time. For, for Stacy, for me. But then again, you pray, you pray, you pray for comfort. And you're not going to receive an answer. You probably won't receive a miracle. We didn't receive the miracle of children. We didn't end up like with an Abraham and Sarah, even though sometimes, especially when we go through the Old Testament cycle and I read Abraham and Sarah's story, I'm like, 99, it's possible. <laughs> and <laughs> she's definitely still as beautiful and wonderful as Sarah was. <laughs> I'm so getting in trouble tonight for all of this lovey-dovey stuff. <laughs> yeah. Craig, I might need a room at your house. <laughs> so, but yeah, you just, you will have these challenges, and then you will have the challenges of, like I did, P many people in my life who, who, who are, who are important, have lost their faith. They had their own faith crisis and left the church. 
But the thing that sustains me always is I trust in the Lord. And there's a phrase I love, keep an eye single to the glory of the Lord. If we keep our eyes single and we practice our faith and we ignore we ignore the, the troubles, not ignore them, but accept them and look for the positive in them and try and learn from them, then things will be right. Now, President Nelson has been pushing the covenant path, staying on the covenant path. And I think I single on the covenant path and he's not saying the covenant path is smooth, flowers along the way. He's saying just stay on the covenant path. Elder Bidnar talks about be ready for your next ordinance, whether it's going to the temple to participate in an ordinance or whether it's a sacrament. Make sure you're ready for the sacrament and that you take it. All of these things will sustain you and will help you. Being at church, being close, staying focused, praying with, with all your heart, might, mind, and strength. The things will be fine, I promise you that. Stacy had cancer three years ago. A nasty, one of the worst kind of cancer, breast cancer you can get. And it was treatable only with multiple, she, a chemo medicine she took was called the Red Devil. And we went through that trial, a year, a year and a half of it, and then recovery afterwards. And you learn from these things. Life is difficult. And here is a thing from the restored gospel that always gives me comfort, and I hope it gives you comfort. We are children of God. We met in heaven in a council. The Lord showed us the plan. We accepted the plan. We're here. And the plan is that life is going to be chaotic. Just push through, be faithful, and make it back home. And that's what we do. As Latter-day Saints, that's what we do. God isn't out there saying, what can I do to Jabra and Stacy today to make things hard for them? He doesn't do that. The plan is we come to this earth, we practice our agency, and we overcome difficulties. And this is a hard time for most of you are young. I mean, most of you would be the, as old as my children if Stacy and I had had them. So I want you to learn from the life experience I had. Things will be okay. Just don't, don't just know this. Things will be okay. Just stay focused on the Lord, stay close to the church. That's what will get you through it, through everything. I promise you that, I know that's true. And keep, keep your eyes on what the prophets, seers, and revelators of this church say. Seriously, they, you can't, you can't go wrong following them. You can't, I know it. I've, I've been through President Benson, President Hinckley, President Hunter, President Monson, all great men. And I, being, translating their words, working with, with what they said, you tend to understand it at a deeper level and absorb it, probably. Every conference, I read every talk probably a dozen times, no exaggeration. Edits, that's the fate of an editor. You're always editing typos and making sure you didn't make mistakes, so you read things over and over. But that's good, because it always kept me, kept me in a way sane, kept me happy, and kept me healthy, and kept me strong. So that's my advice to you. Conference is coming up, so focus on it. Anyway, I'm five minutes over, ain't I, Craig, huh? Oh. So I just want to conclude again with my testimony. I know this church is true. Stay close to it. I know we're led by prophets, seers, and revelators. I love them, they're good men, they're chosen men, and by following them we can't go wrong. And I want, you to tell, I want to tell you again, I don't know any of you, 
but I love you, your family, your all family. And now that we've had this association, when we go make it over there, God willing, we'll, we'll enjoy each other's company, right? So, and I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Now it feels weird, I'm gonna go sit there a moment. <laughs>